So, you know, Ellen, nowadays kids are really like enterprising, really entrepreneurial. And Mm -hmm. my 15 year old has decided she wants to launch her own line of clothing. Do it, honey. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I'm so excited for her. And you know what I told her? I said, that's fine. You can do it all with Shopify. (laughs) I swear to God, we had this conversation. (laughs) Absolutely. Shopify is a global commerce platform that helps you at every stage of your business, whether you're 15 or 50, you can launch your own shop at any time. It is so user-friendly. Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkout up to 36% better. And here's the thing, like whether you are starting up or whether you've had, you've had an in-person business forever, I mean, like Shopify can help you at every stage of your business and growing it. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash solve the case, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash solve the case now to grow your business no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash solve the case. Cha-ching. Cha-ching. Hey, Ellen. How are you? I'm good. I'm, I'm happy. You see the smile on my face? I'm excited. Why are you so excited? Because it has been a long... Today's episode has been a long time coming, girl. Been a long time it's, coming. This is actually no joke for... Well, first of all, welcome Hillary Burton to yeah. the show. <laughs> oh, I'm the one that's excited. I'm Wait. the one that's geeking uh, out. How long? First of all, the minute we... Hillary was going to come on. She was like, I'm choosing this case. Yeah. That is it. When was that? Was like 1942 ish yes. around? That it was before been... I got my gray hair. It was so yeah. long ago. <laughs> I we love have the been hair planning though. this. Gorgeous. This yeah. has been scheduled and rescheduled more times than my first wedding. Listen, it's... Hillary is busy, Ellen. <laughs> she, she is busy. She's busy. Well, also. Like, I really wanted (laughs) – this was a me time kind of thing. This was, like, a pleasurable experience for me to be able to do this with you guys. So I didn't want it, like, mashed up in between all the other shit you do when you're doing, like, a press tour. So now that I have a little bit of room to breathe, I get to have a ladies' afternoon with you guys. I love it. That's what I wanted. And for those of you watching on YouTube, Hillary is rocking my most favorite thing, and that is a wallpaper accent wall. (laughs) I have – Girl, so I got a velvet paper. curtain for you on this what? side. I still have to steam out the wrinkles. Um, nice. This is, this is girl space. Are you a professional podcaster, Hillary? Because that is a very podcast, professional podcast looking <sighs> space to me. Drama queens. That's yeah, I do drama queens. Yeah. Like. And we have It Couldn't Happen Here, the podcast, which oh, is- Oh, I didn't know you had a podcast for that. Okay. Yeah, it's a spinoff of, of the TV show that I can yeah. talk about now because the strike's over. We do a show on Sundance that you and I- met on, which was like a huge highlight for me. Uh, I got a call from the producer and he's like, do you know Rabia? And I was like, what? She's coming on our show. (laughs) And I had to be cool. And it was so- you covered a case that is so near and dear to my heart. And, you know, I mean, like it's still plodding along. Poor Greg Lance is still in prison. And, you know, like- Talk to He just made me a- Did he ever- Did Greg ever build anything for you? you Oh, I got a house. Yeah. I got a house, but he has recently made me a pink casket. What? And I got a text message from his mom and it just said, Greg made a casket for you. And I'm like, I feel, I, I, I what's the context here? So yeah. anyhow, amazing guy. Um, and so, you know, Hillary, I can't wait till he comes home because we'll both be there. Well, that's it. You and I are going to go to Tennessee together and work on that case. And I'm excited about that. Get him out. I'll come make Instagram stories. Yes, yes. please. Yes, you do that too. That's so, what I'll do. <laughs> yeah, we started doing this podcast version of It Couldn't Happen Here because you can only fit so much information into 42 minutes of television and we were covering cases where there's people like Greg who are trapped in prison and they need everyone to have all the details. So we covered two cases this year, one in North Carolina and another in Texas and they drive me crazy. They make me stay up at night. They make me go down rabbit holes like this case. Mm -hmm. Like this case, which we will get to, but this is the time that all of our guests hate because we just like sit and embarrass you for a little bit. And no one told talk, me about this. <laughs> and talk, no one talk about all the things you've done. Hillary is an actress, also a mom of two. You probably know her from One Tree Hill or Grey's Anatomy or her movies or the 
the reboot of Lethal Weapon, but I'm going to embarrass you and tell you, do you know where I first know you from? Please don't be mad at me. I'm not. What's going to make me mad? Well, like in my mind, when I hear your name, do you Uh, know what I think of? No. TRL. Oh, we were fresh babes yeah. right out of the womb <laughs> on that show. I was like, is she going to be mad about that? No. I don't know. But you've done everything. And now, like, you produce and um, you podcast and obviously you do a ton of charity work. But how are you loving the podcast space? Because you guys are nailing it. I don't know. I almost said a bad word. Do you guys cuss on your show? We do. I like oh, boundaries. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. No. Okay. <laughs> yeah. No. I. It's so much fucking easier for me because I came up as a VJ – Mm-hmm. learning how to look at information and relay information. And that was right. my job for years. Yeah. And the acting thing I'd been doing since I was a little kid, but that also was something that made a lot of other people in my life happy. Not like uh, I yeah. liked it. I didn't love it. Mm. I love it more when I get to work with my friends, but hosting and being able to boil down information into a palatable form so that it can be relayed to an audience is something that I found I was good at and I really liked doing and I liked connecting with people. And so being able to come for full circle and go back to that as a grown up is cool, right? Yeah, I never thought of that. I never thought that that would totally prepare you for a podcast. I'm just a grown yeah. up VJ, ladies. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> it is a very natural transition. I, you know, I mean, like it makes total sense. Yeah. I mean, yeah. they got all the VJs from radio DJs. I think maybe I was the only one that wasn't a radio DJ. Mm-hmm. And so I'm just going back. It's like getting your bachelor's after you've already done all of the, like, the real life work. <laughs> yeah. Just going yeah. back. It's easy peasy. That's what you mean. Sure, sure. Yeah. Easy peasy. <laughs> no, and it's- you're a working mom. You have a boy and a girl. How old are they? You have a 13-year-old boy and I have a five-year-old girl. And oh. Okay. They've both inherited this like righteous sense of justice. You know, they have to like watch all the programming that I watch. Even the five year old? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh. like backwards. Like she she has a six year old boy. Oh, right. Yeah. You have an older daughter and a younger son. Yeah. I have two older daughters. They're so cute. Yeah, um, but my my six year old knows nothing beyond Legos. I feel like a five year old girl is in a different emotional, intellectual space Mm -hmm. than a six year old boy. I mean, he just yeah. a big panda, yeah. Just no, downtown. she thinks that she's friends with all of my older kids' friends, like, yeah, and that yeah. the you know when they come over, they're there to see her. Yeah. It's <laughs> certainly not him. They are. They she she's right. Yeah. One day yeah. she yeah. won't yeah. be wrong, and that's yeah. terrifying. <laughs> You've got some time, though. Before we jump into three quick things, which is the little game we play on the show where we each (laughs) ask you a question and then we each ask everyone the same question. I just want to do a follow up question on something you mentioned. You guys did uh, drama. Drama Queens did a live tour. You guys did like a whole. Oh, yeah. Just tell us how many. Ellen, they had a bus. I want a bus. I want a tour bus for me and Ellen. Oh, no, babe, you thought that was a tour bus? Wrong. (laughs) No, we couldn't figure out how to get our asses and all of our luggage and also like the people helping us from city to city. We went to Boston and then New York City and then DC and then Philadelphia. And it was getting to be the 11th hour and we still didn't have a game plan that made sense. Like, Mm -hmm. are we going to fly to every place? Are we going to drive? You know, like, yeah, we're going to be in multiple cars. And I was like, I can figure out how to drive an RV. And everyone was like, (laughs) I don't know, Hillary, can you? And I love it. I've been driving big cars my whole life. Like I was the kid that learned to drive in a suburban in high school. I was like, how much harder can an RV be <laughs> <laughs> in urban settings? Oh where you're God. like <laughs> going oh through God. five lanes of traffic trying to make your exit. Wait, where it, would you park it? Would you have to find RV parks? Yeah, no, listen, I I parked at a Food Lion once. I parked at a Walmart once. Like, I'm the lady in the parking lot with the RV just, like, waiting on an Uber to come pick her up. Oh, um, my like, God. Harold, the girl from Grey's Anatomy is in a big RV <laughs> yeah. over here. Well, and the guy, I so swear. We, we She's emptying out it. the toilet. <laughs> we rented it from, like, a – um. It's like Airbnb, but for RVs. Yeah, and the man that so came and delivered it to my house was like, you going on, like, a girl's weekend or something? You know? Yeah, yeah. Yes, something, sir. It's a bachelorette like party. That. Don't no, ask any more questions. I have never been in an RV. I've heard RV stories, but the one thing that prevents me from doing the RV thing because my son really wants to do it yeah. is I do understand you have to at some point pull over and open up like the toilet. You know what I mean? Like empty out yeah. like the toilet. Like who did that part? 
I didn't let anyone use the toilet because oh, I'm I a monster. You. There you go. I would be you. <laughs> there you go. I'd be like, squeeze it. I don't <laughs> care if you have a turtle head yeah. poking out. Go to the McDonald's. It's yeah. for We're show, going- you guys. That toilet is for show. Brilliant. There is no Brilliant. pooping on the RV. Yeah. I am with you. You got to squeeze it. Yeah. Work with, like, just, yeah, absolutely. I am When with you're you, the Hillary. driver, you're allowed to impose rules. I so. Love that. I love that. We need to do mm-hmm. we need to do like a girls podcasting mega yes. tour and then we'll get a bus. Ooh. <laughs> I can drive it now. And and you by the it. way, my husband made me drive again at Christmas time because we were going on a long trip and he's like, Well, now that you know how to do this, now that you have this skill set, we're gonna use it. I and so it. I'm the I'm the bus driver. This is all Rabia wants in the world. I love it. This is one of my favorite sentences to say, Rabia. This episode of Rabia and Ellen is brought to you by Wild Grain. <laughs> Wild Grain is the first ever bake from frozen subscription box for sourdough breads, fresh pastas, and artisanal pastries. Pretty much everything that has ever been on the Wild Grain website, I have tried. So I consider myself a Wild Grain expert. Mm. I love the a connoisseur, bread. if you will. Yeah. I love the pastas. I love the waffles. True story. True story. I was having a conversation with another podcaster today who doesn't do host read ads. And she's like, is it worth doing? I said, for things like wild grain, yeah. (laughs) I said, for wild grain, you want to do it? It really is. 25 minutes. You can whip up gorgeous homemade bread that smells like it's fresh from the bakery. And you can now fully customize your wild grain box so you can get any combination of breads or pastas or pastries that you like. If you want an, a box of all bread, all pasta, all pastries, you can have it. It's yours. Yep. And for a limited time, you can get $30 off your first box plus free croissants. I said croissants like an American in every box. <laughs> when you go to when you go to wildgreen.com slash solve the case to start your subscription. You heard Rabia, fresh croissants. I said it right, in every mm-hmm. box and thirty dollars off your first box when you go to wildgrain.com slash solve the case. That's wildgrain.com slash solve the case, or you can use promo code solve the case at checkout. <laughs> you can pretend you're a chef like me. <laughs> the nights are flipping cold, Ellen. They are cold. Not when we snuggle. Okay, there's that. But you know what's what's hard on a cold night, harder for me than other nights, is actually going to sleep. And that's why I love Beam. I love Beam. There are so many things. When my sleep is out of whack, it can... It can affect my mood, my skin, my hair, my weight, my mental health. Everything is attributed to your sleep. And if you sleep less than six to seven hours, that's right, six to seven hours, it can be linked to reduce low blood cell count. And that is what helps prevent your body from getting sick and allows it to fight illness better. It's just not a good idea to not have good quality sleep. Yep. That's why we love Beam Dream. We have been raving about their dream powder, um, which is healthy hot cocoa for sleep. It's actually so delicious too. It is so good. There's also other flavors like the cinnamon cacao, the sea salt caramel, which I think is my favorite, and the white Mm. chocolate. Better sleep has never tasted so good. It's white chocolate peppermint. White chocolate peppermint. Perfect for Christmas. Better Mm -hmm. sleep never tasted better. Yep. And a recent clinical study revealed that Dream helped 93% of users wake up feeling more refreshed and 93% reported that Dream helped them get a more restful night's sleep. All you have to do is mix that Beam Dream in with some hot water or some milk. You stir it or you froth it right before bed and you will go nine eyes. Do you prefer water? I do water. Yeah. I do milk. All right, so find out why Forbes and New York Times are all talking about Beam and why it's trusted by the world's top athletes and business professionals. If you want to try Beam's best-selling dream powder, take advantage of their biggest sale of the year and get 50% off for a limited time, if you go to shopbeam.com slash solve the case, the discount is auto applied at checkout, no code necessary. That's shopbeam.com slash solve the case for up to 50% off. Oh, you will love it. Beam, take me away. Mm-hmm. Beam me up. Get it? <laughs> Let's jump into three quick things. Rabia, what is your question for Hillary? Okay. Our questions can be about anything, Hillary. So brace Ooh, yourself. Danger. Yeah. Here's my question. Okay. Tell, tell us about your first kiss. <laughs> well, that's a good one. Yeah, he that's- is currently a flight attendant and a hairdresser. Um, oh, I know where this that is That tells going. me something. <laughs> yep. 
I was a very unlikable fifth grader. Very unlikable. But the feather in my cap is that I was doing plays at the high school. And so I didn't need to hang out with my like 10-year-old peers, you know? They thought I was such a dork. But I was hanging out with high school kids. And they were doing a production of The Music Man. And so there were some also like middle school kids who were in this play. For the little town playing, kids. Yeah. Playing the Iowa towns people. And this sixth grade boy like really liked my hair. And he thought I dressed pretty cool. And we liked all the same stuff. And the high schoolers dared us to kiss back by like the, the chorus room. Wow. And we did. <laughs> We kissed. And in front then, of everybody. Oh, yeah. Hell yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I was in love. Like, I was in love. I wrote oh. this boy letters, <laughs> and I currently stalk him on the internet because still, <laughs> you know, like 30-something years later, I just think he's so wonderful because he didn't yeah. care that everyone else thought I was a dork. He was oh. like, I think she's great. And I appreciate that kind of- Does he you know, know you stalk him? Have you reached out to him? No. He knows. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't I'm know. sure he must. Like, can you imagine looking at your follower list and being like, "Yeah, why like, is that yeah. nerd?" Chad! <laughs> Everyone say hi to Chad. Yeah. Oh God, I just loved him, and he's just as handsome as ever, and his husband looks just like him, and they're just oh so handsome together. And amazing. Yeah, there is not a single woman listening who has not been in love with a gay man at one time or another. <laughs> yeah, and that was just the first one. Men. You know, yeah, I am right now. His name is Joey. Um, <laughs> yes, Joey. my other podcast partner he's up there, Joey Toronto. I love yes, him. So he's, oh, I've he's, seen pictures of you guys. He is a doll. He is yes, a doll. He's, yeah. I get he it. Is I, I stalk my fifth grade crush too, mm -hmm. but uh, I dodged a bullet. Is all I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> You're going back to look because it feels good. You're like hey. seriously. I'm like. Pfft. Okay. Okay. My question. Okay. I'm not not jealous, but if I were to ever have two, I would always love to have a girl and a boy. Mm -hmm. But we always talk about how different it is raising girls and boys, and it's so different now. So, what are the major lessons that you mm -hmm. are teaching your girl mm -hmm. and your boy, not at the ages they are, but just about like life and the world and sex and people. Like what yeah. are your like overarching themes that you're like, I'm telling this to my girl and this to my boy. So I found a shortcut with my son that kind of encompasses all the stuff that I want him to know, like non-toxic masculinity and empathy and, you know, community service, you know, just kind of like a different way of centering one's focus where it's not just about you and pleasure. And so with my son at a young age, I started showing him movies and TV shows and reading him books that had female protagonists. Mm -hmm. And so that means he grew up on Anne of Green Gables and mm -hmm. he grew up like seeing women in positions where they weren't damsels in distress, mm. where they also weren't necessarily like broken women who became badasses. They were nuanced, complicated creatures that deserved respect and were really like highly lovable. And so my son has always been really incredible with women. Oh, love it. Because I think he was exposed to this. And so two weeks ago, we watched the new Little Women together. And mm. I really didn't know how this 13-year-old boy was going to take it. And that child loved that movie so much. Oh. It was just like, can we watch it again? Oh. Love it. And so I think that's a great shortcut with boys because you're not telling them it's bad to be a boy. Yeah. But the same way girls can watch male narratives and be into it. I think yeah. boys should be able to do the same thing. I am 100% right. doing that with my son now. Oh, Thank God. you for that I, shortcut. I love boys that. Boys that's, that's love that kind of content and yeah. no one, they're not going to ask for it, right? Yeah. They're yeah. not going to be like, can I watch Meet Me in St. Louis with you? You know? <laughs> but guess what? They sit yeah. there for the whole thing. They're yeah. into it. Oh, I love um, that. And then with my daughter, it was just like teaching her to go from zero to fuck you so fast that no one can ever hinder that. She's a terrifying animal. And <laughs> all of the like, so yeah, I, was, I was a people pleaser. And so when you strip that from a child, all that's left is pure personality. Mm. And so uh, that's a learning curve for me because I was definitely like, whatever you guys want me to do, I'll be whatever you want me to be. I'll mm. make straight A's. I'll be perfect. And this kid's like, fuck you. I'm a dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 
It's just different. I the, I, I fucking love, love little yeah. badass girls. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. little badass girls who like grab a toad by the neck or whatever they want. <laughs> She's They're so just, scary. Like, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Hillary, that doesn't change. Right. Like my 14-year-old is the scariest person <sighs> on the planet. <laughs> And I say I, am, I can't wait, but like maybe I can wait yeah. just like a little bit. Sometimes she'll like come home from like a rehearsal or like ballet, and I'm like, oh. like I just like <laughs> jolt. I'm like, she's home. Oh god, yeah. like, it is because the you, judgment of my have... 14 now 15 year old is the only judgment I fear. And, and I'm not kidding. I don't fear anybody else's judgment. Yeah, it's just yeah. her her face, that eye, the eyes, the <sighs> eye roll. When You're she sees such me taking idiot, Rabia. You're I know. an idiot. You're dumb. You don't know. Oh me. God, it's gonna hurt. When I take a selfie, I mean, the way she looks at me is like, I, it's it hurts. But you're yeah. so embarrassing. I am so. You are so embarrassing. <laughs> well, that's it. It doesn't matter how cool you are. Like your child is going to think you are the biggest dork yeah. ever, and just be mortified. So wait, before I, I mean, I know we could talk about this forever. Do you know what my daughter asked me to stop doing? What commenting on her Instagram? <gasps> Yeah. Oh. She was like, Mom, I know you mean well. I know you just want to support me, but can you please not comment on my Instagram? It's so cringe. Oh cringe? God. Yeah. Oh God, that hurts. It hurts uh, so bad. It just like it just then it just keeps turning. Yeah. It just keeps turning <laughs> the night. It gets worse oh. and worse up until about twenty three or twenty four. Then suddenly the pendulum swings back. And yeah. she's yeah. gonna love her mama, oh, and want her oh. mama. Because your daughter just got married, right? Well, no, my eldest got engaged in May. Got we engaged. are currently planning the wedding, which oh. is next September. And beautiful is a lot. Yeah, I'm gonna sell both I'm my sure. to make this happen. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Instagram has has made her crazy. My daughter, I mean, bridezillas nowadays have Instagram to refer to because yeah. uh, you know, coming in by helicopter, sure, why not? I mean, like, it's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's doing it. Up yeah. next, me, Rabia, and Hillary start our parenting girls podcast right, right, right. coming soon. <laughs> and Hillary, we ask all of our guests the same question. Okay. How does true crime fit into your life? Yeah. So this is this is what I studied in college. When really? I Yeah, oh. so I had been acting forever and I had an agent in New York City. So I'd made up my mind I was gonna go to school in Manhattan so that I could audition on the, you know, Mm -hmm. days off and stuff like that. But my, my passion was true crime. And so I was a kid that like took the Richard Ramirez book to senior beach week. And I had Manson quotes all over my megaphone. Like at the end of cheerleading, when I graduated, they gave me my megaphone because they're like, no one's going (laughs) to reuse this Hillary. (laughs) Like it was just covered in Manson quotes for whatever reason. I was obsessed with it. And so I got to college and I started like actually studying the phenomenon of serial killers in the United States and what that meant in our media and what that meant in our culture. And really what it boiled down to for me, what I wrote my little freshman year paper on was that women in our country are so conditioned to be prey. You know, there are predators everywhere. You cannot walk to your car through a parking lot without worrying about being violently assaulted. And so women as natural preppers, we're the people who like prep our homes, prep our families. We take care of things. We do all of that invisible labor. When it comes to prepping for ourselves, we're doing this invisible labor of trying to learn as much as we humanly can about disaster and about violence. Because if we can just ingest enough of it, we can probably prevent it in our own life. You know, that's the hope that we can sidestep it if we just study it hard enough. Mm. And I think that's why women are so drawn to this subject matter because it's, you know, if you can solve the puzzle, then hopefully you don't fall into the same trap that the other girl did. Totally. Invisible labor. Yeah. That's so true. Yeah. Yeah. Just constantly consuming, learning, finding out the details, watching a documentary, then Googling it all night long. I mean, it's all about foresight for women. Like we're always thinking ahead. Like even if it's like, okay, I'm going to make this meal on Sunday, which means on Thursday I got to get this stuff. And then by Friday I got to get these ingredients. Like you're always, always, always. And I'm like, it's, you know, with both my daughters, I am, I mean, they're like mama's crazy, but I'm always sending them 
like news stories. Oh, the this articles. woman, yeah, the articles. Mm-hmm. I'm like, look, or when you go to a hotel, like this is what you got to do. You know what I mean? Oof. I like, I can't stop. I can't stop doing it. And I, and I don't think it's because my life is my, and my work is around true crime. I think it's because I'm a woman. I think you're exactly yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. No, we're yeah. we're natural prey, and we've been told oh, that our entire oh, lives. Oh, it's awful I know. to think about it like that. Yeah. It's like you feel like you want to sugarcoat it, but that's just how it is. I mean, every story we hear and it just it just doesn't stop. We were just talking on our other show about women just we can't even we literally can't even put a drink down no. and yeah. go in our bag. I yeah. mean, it's Yeah. Let me ask you something. Is 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 Jeffrey also into true crime or is it like most of our uh, uh not who are as like, much. Oh, thank you. No, <laughs> drag, I know. He's a drag along. I, no, I know that he is trying to make me happy when I walk into our room and he has Dateline on. And I'm just like, oh, babe. It's, so sweet. <laughs> it's foreplay. You're trying so hard. You know what he, he – yeah, that's horrible. Uh, he's gotten very, like, emotionally invested in a number of the cases we've covered for It awesome. Couldn't Happen Here. So mm-hmm. he is, like, crazy about Greg Lance getting out. Oh, you know, oh, and wonderful. he's made videos and stuff about yeah, Greg. Yeah, I've, no, I've seen them. Yeah. Um, so he's really invested in that case. We've got another case, uh, Tyro Nolan, who's on death row in Ohio, and he's pretty invested in that. And I had to do a case in Georgia when he was filming down there, and it was a man who I cannot say for sure whether or not he killed his wife, but there are a number of people who believe so. Mm. And there's a number of signs pointing to that. And it's a cold case. It's a cold case. It's it's uh, been listed as oh there's it's an undetermined death but they tried mm. to make it look like a suicide and it's definitely okay. not a suicide. Okay. Ooh. And so my husband was with me while I was having to talk to this man on the phone and he saw just how freaked out I was having to talk yeah. to someone. I mean, you know, when you have to talk to someone who is potentially a killer yeah. and just play nice with them so they actually answer your questions, that's a weird weird deal. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And so, yeah, he's been, he's been around for all of that, uh, and is super supportive of it. So love it. Yeah. It's good to have a partner that isn't as dark as you are, but can go there. Speaking of dark. Oh yeah. Thanks for picking this case. (laughs) Tell (laughs) everyone the case that you chose Mm -hmm. and then tell us why you chose the most complicated (laughs) unsolved case in all of true crime history. (laughs) Well, today, ladies, we are going to go down that dark, winding rabbit hole of the Zodiac Killer. Mm. Oh, okay. Why, Hillary? Why? Yeah, why? Yeah, there's so many. This is actually your fault, Rubia. Uh, I made friends online with Rebecca. Is it Lebreca, Rebecca Lavoy? Oh, yeah, Lavoy, yeah. Yep. Okay, so Rebecca and I start following each other because of Undisclosed, and yeah. she posted a book recommendation one mm-hmm. day, and it was all about the Zodiac Killer. And okay. it was actually two books. Um, they'd come out like post-pandemic, and the first one was called Motor Spirit uh, by Jarrett Kobeck, and that just oh. detailed – the killings, mm. right? It really went into detail with the killings and it cut out all of the media okay. representation oh, of the case and yeah. just went straight back to the police documents, the facts, to the crime scene photos, the facts. That's what right? I like. That's what I love. Okay. Girl, you got to cut out the spin. Yeah. And mm-hmm. so I read that and I was like, huh, everything I've been told about the Zodiac is not right. Like mm. none of these pieces line up. Right. None of the suspects that we've been presented really make sense when you look at the facts. Ooh, and then he came book. out with book two. Book two is called How to Find the Zodiac. And Ooh. this dude went on a deep dive. And I think he figured out who the Zodiac is. Really? Okay. I do. I do. And so that's why when – when you guys were like, what case do you want to do? I was like, oh, oh, me, me oh. over here. You had Zodiac. just gotten – you were Dance. reading the book or had just gotten done reading the book? Yeah. Yeah, I was reading the book Ordering while I was right on tour. Now. Okay. Yeah, and and Rebecca – you know, I communicated with her about this and I was like, this is insane. I don't know why this isn't getting more traction. And so hmm. we're the traction. We're putting out the vibe today. This needs This needs a closer look. I want to know about all of the fake the the fake or the dead end suspects. Mm-hmm. 
Rabia, do you go by recommendations for things online? Like, do you always ask for a recommendation from people? hundred percent, especially when it's like a service, like a personal service. Yeah, I have. I must. Could you imagine trying to find a new doctor without a recommendation? I just wouldn't do it. No, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't do that for a nail salon, but definitely not a doctor. <laughs> well, you do not have to worry because ZocDoc is here. It is going to help you find and book the doctor that is right for you. And most important, sorry to say it, a doctor that takes your insurance. Not only takes your insurance, but also can see you in a timely way. And ZocDoc can hook you up with all those things. Right. Why would they introduce you to the best doctor that fits all your needs, that takes your insurance, that can't see you? They will match you with someone within 48 hours. ZocDoc. It is the place to find and book great doctors who also have amazing reviews and A lot of them have appointments within 24 hours. That alone is reason to try ZocDoc. Yep. And you can do all the booking online through the app. You don't have to make any phone calls, wait on the line. I mean, come on. So go to ZocDoc.com slash solve the case and download the ZocDoc app for free. Then find and book a top rated doctor today. That is Z-O-C-D-O-C dot com slash solve the case. ZocDoc.com slash solve the case. Rabia, I don't even need to look at this copy because I have loved Rocket Money for so long. You know I am so careful with my finances. Yes, that's why you actually have money. (laughs) Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions and monitors your spending, and it helps you lower your actual bills all in one place. I have done that so many times. I have signed up for something to get a discount, to get yep. free shipping, and then they sneaky snake get in there and they you get a bill for $17.99 and you're like, what the heck? Rocket Money is like, hey now, do you really want to keep that subscription? It's yeah. like kind of a nosy best friend, but it's right in an app. Right. <laughs> and you know what I've done so many times, I've signed up for things thinking, I will absolutely remember to cancel this in 90 days. No, you won't. No, no, I won't. I don't even remember I have it. It's okay though, Rabia, because 80% of people have subscriptions that they have forgotten about. It is just too easy to subscribe and then forget things. How much do you think you pay a month in subscriptions? Just guess. Throw it out there. I'm guessing... About 100 bucks. Okay. Most people say about 80, but they're actually pay- paying closer to 200. Mm. And that's why Rocket Money is going to be there. It is a personal finance app. It finds, cancels those unwanted subscriptions like the best friend you never hand and monitors your spending. I get these emails that are like, Psst, Ellen, did you mean to spend $200 at McDonald's this month? <laughs> <laughs> Look, with over 5 million users and counting, Rocket Money has helped save its customers an average of $720 a year. Imagine what you can do with that. And of $1 billion in savings so far. So stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions and manage your money the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash solve the case. That's rocketmoney.com slash solve the case. Let's go to the crash course. Curiosity is a fundamental human trait. Everyone is curious, but the object and the degree of that curiosity is different depending on the person and the situation. Oftentimes, people are unable to overcome the urge to rubberneck at an accident scene, or we will scan through the timeline of a friend of a friend of a friend's social media to find out if they're still with that guy you always hated from high school. But humans also like a challenge. The media has been captivated by the murders of the notorious and elusive Zodiac Killer for five decades. Sadly, murderers of all walks have done their evil and unthinkable acts since then. But why do we keep coming back to this case? One could say it's because of his sensational relationship with the media. His hallmark was calling the police right after a murder and sending letters to newspapers in the weeks following. He did this constantly. He sent dozens of letters threatening various crimes and the messages contained complex ciphers that promised to reveal his identity. Well, by the end of the 1970s, the letters ceased. The Zodiac is the basis for the archetypal serial killer, The smart loner who kills because he likes it, or maybe because he likes the attention? The lack of motive and sheer randomness of his murder adds to the scary reality 
that he outsmarted so many. So who is the Zodiac Killer? The short answer is, nobody knows. But the theories are endless. Google the phrase, who is the Zodiac Killer, and you'll get a list of people from Ted Bundy to Ted Cruz. And yet, all these years later, police seem no closer to capturing the elusive killer. Let's go back. On December 20th, 1968, two high school kids, Betty Lou Jensen and David Faraday, were on their first date. Like most teenagers do, they pulled into a lover's lane type area in Benicia, a quaint town in Solano County. That night on Lake Herman Road, they would be the first victims of the Zodiac Killers. Both Betty and David were shot at point blank range and died within minutes. The weapon was a 22 caliber semi-automatic pistol. There were no witnesses, indication of robbery, or sexual molestation. The second murder attributed to the Zodiac was 22-year-old Darlene Farron and 19-year-old Mike McGow. Though he was shot five times, Mike lived to tell his story. According to the surviving victim, the young couple had parked at an isolated location to talk. A car, possibly a light brown Ford Mustang or Chevy Corvair, pulled into the lot just a few feet away. A man with a flashlight exited the vehicle and approached them. They were alone in the parking lot and thought it was a police officer, so naturally the couple had their identification ready. Without warning, the man began firing at the couple. McGow got a look at him. The man was white, 5'8 to 5'9 height, in his late 20s to early 30s, with a stocky build, round face, brown hair, and didn't speak a word. Until approximately 45 minutes later, when the Vallejo Police Department received a call from a man claiming responsibility for the attack. He correctly identified the weapon used as a 9mm and also took credit for the Faraday Jensen murders of December 20th, 1968. Even with this ominous phone call, the investigation was at a standstill. Until on July 31st, 1969, when a series of letters were sent to the San Francisco Examiner, Vallejo Times Herald, and San Francisco Chronicle. In the letters, the killer laid claim to the murders of Faraday, Jensen, and Farron. To squelch doubters, there were details in these letters that only the person who committed these heinous acts would have known, and each letter contained one-third of a cipher that, if solved, supposedly contained the killer's identity. While the killer hadn't yet given himself the name Zodiac, this marked the beginning of a letter-writing spree that would go on for more than five years. The Zodiac Killer's fourth confirmed victim came on September 29, 1969. Brian Hartnell and Cecilia Shepard were picnicking at Lake Berryessa in Napa County when they were approached by a man wearing a black executioner's type hood with clip-on sunglasses over the eye holes as well as a bib with a cross circle symbol on it. He claimed he was an escaped convict who had killed a guard and stolen a car but needed a new car to continue his journey as his was, quote, too hot. The man then made Miss Shepard tie Mr. Hartnell up he then stabbed them both multiple times before drawing the cross circle symbol on Mr. Hartnell's car with a black felt tip pen and writing the date, time, and location of the attack. The victims were both still alive when help arrived and were taken to the hospital in critical condition. Hartnell survived and Shepard died two days later from her injuries. Around 7.40 that night, Napa County Police received a call that reported the incident and claimed to be the perpetrator saying, I want to report a murder. No, a double murder. A palm print was recovered from the telephone, but it has never been successfully matched. The final murder that is confirmed to be the work of the Zodiac Killer occurred on October 11th, 1969. Paul Stein was working as a taxi driver when he picked up a male driver who asked to be driven to Washington and Maple Streets in Presidio Heights in San Francisco. Mr. Stein drove one block past Maple to Cherry Street and the passenger then shot him in the head and took his wallet car keys, and a piece of his blood-stained shirt. Then right on schedule, on October 13th, the San Francisco Chronicle received a letter from the Zodiac claiming to be the murderer of Paul Stein, which police had initially suspected to be a routine robbery. The letter contained the bloodied piece of Mr. Stein's shirt. This time, there were witnesses. Three teenagers saw the killer and called 911 and reported a man. However, somewhere the identity was lost in translation and the operator told police it was a black man. So in that detail, there is a chance the Zodiac slipped through the San Francisco PD's fingers once again. Obviously, a mysterious string of murders would leave any city left with ample fear and confusion. But don't forget, beyond the awful murders, the killer taunted authorities and the public 
with a series of letters containing encrypted messages, which had a series of symbols, letters, reverse letters, and numbers, challenging anyone to decipher their hidden meanings. The Zodiac sent four coded messages in total to the paper in 1969 and 1970. The first had 408 characters and was cracked in a week. But it wasn't until the COVID-19 pandemic, when people found extra time on their hands, that three researchers on three separate continents solved the 340 character cipher officially in 2021. They've sparked countless theories about the identity of the Zodiac Killer and the motives behind his heinous crimes. The remaining messages contained within these ciphers could potentially hold crucial information that could lead to identifying suspects or shedding light on more victims' tragic fate. The Zodiac Killer's ability to create intricate codes that have withstood decades of scrutiny speaks volumes of his intelligence. As technology advances and new code-breaking techniques emerge, there is hope that one day these enigmatic messages will be fully deciphered. The Zodiac might be the ultimate cold case. There have been thousands of Zodiac suspects and 12 named Zodiac killer persons of interest so far, but each suspect never perfectly lines up with every bit of information that has been gathered over the years. The killer could be alive or dead, in prison for another crime, or still free. If we really think about it, the killer might not even be one person. The problem is we may never know for sure, which is one of the scariest details about the case. While many questions remain unanswered about the Zodiac Killer's identity, his impact on popular culture cannot be denied. Books, films, and documentaries have sought to explore and analyze this captivating case, keeping public interest alive. There is so much to say and uncover about the Zodiac. We'll try and do our best today. But one thing is for sure, the killer is a man, because the audacity. Think about it. The fact that he was able to evade capture and taunt law enforcement with his cryptic communications time and time again, as well as eluding identification and leaving behind a trail of unsolved cases, it's fueled speculation time and time again as to his identity and motives. Lack of conclusive evidence or suspects also leads to the allure. As we delve into the dark world of the Zodiac and all serial killers for that matter, it is essential that we remember not only their heinous acts, but we also pay tribute to those lives that were taken too soon. The search for the truth continues as investigators try to bring justice to both victims and their families affected by this chilling chapter in criminal history. So, who do we think the Zodiac Killer is? Let's talk about it. In the crash course, we mentioned, so the five main victims that we talk about. And before we go to suspects, there is one thing I would love to get your opinion on and anyone in the chat as well. We have a live chat here, Hillary, oh, on the side. Oh, sh um, shoot. I see it now. <laughs> yeah. And we are not alone. Um, yeah. <laughs> the thing that media can't agree on, and maybe you can, is... Cherry Joe Bates. Mm -hmm. So Cherry Joe Bates was the murder that happened before the, quote, Zodiac phenomenon in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. This was in 1966 when all of the other ones started in 1958. And this is the one that nobody online can really agree on. And I really took a deep dive into this because I was trying to, everyone is always trying to pinpoint the number of victims. They don't know if it's five. They don't know if it's 38. We'll get into all the copycat stuff in a little bit, mm -hmm. but what are your immediate thoughts on, is it Cherry Joe? Yeah. Wait, yeah. Cherry Joe. Yeah. yeah. Sh Cherry Joe, because this is one of the most highly debated issues about the Zodiac. What are your thoughts? Oh man. You know, I, I think looking at the motive of the Zodiac is really important, right? Because unlike other serial killers, there's no sexual element yeah, to these never. killings, right? There's no robbery element to these killings. There isn't a delusional son of Sam, Satan told me to do it element to these killings. So what's he killing for? Mm -hmm. He's killing for fame. Yep. He wants to be famous. Yep. And... With the Cherry Joe Bates case, I I don't know. You know, it's, let me say something, though. You know, because um, I'm, like, channeling Sarah Kalin. You might have known who Sarah Kalin is because 
she, we, we, we've worked cases together. Our, my last case on Undisclosed, she's an investigator. She's been on our show. She's an incredible yeah. investigator. And her entire field of study and work is sexual predation and sexual and serial killers who have sexual motives. Like, like that's literally her expertise. Yeah. And there's so many times she has stopped me and been like, just because it's not sexual to you doesn't mean it's not sexual to them. Well, okay. Yeah. So she's like, you know, what, what, she's like, you know, so sometimes when you're looking at motives, you, d- just like the power that this might, man might have gotten from just shooting people and killing them like that, that might have given him some element of sexual gratification. And I was like, I remember thinking, okay, but it still doesn't seem sexual to me. You know what I mean? But when the Zodiac I, with the letters. Yeah. The letters are There's the that thing. too. The letters, yeah. There's that too, yeah. I have a, a whole theory on his want for fame. And this the reason I bring up Cherry Joe is because there is are people- Is it Cherry or Cherry? Maybe it's Sherry. It's Cherry. C-H-E-R-I. Is that Cherry or Sherry? I think Sherry. Okay, Sherry, yeah. The thing, you know, because- So for those of you who don't know, we, we touched on it briefly in the crash course, but- she was coming out of the library mm-hmm. and the Zodiac had disabled her car. She also had like a mint green Volkswagen bug, which I thought was adorable. And so then he lured her into the dark. She was outside of the library. He lured her into the dark up a driveway. And it's thought that they stayed there for like an hour and a half. But also she was killed by stab wounds. Mm-hmm. And the the main, main thing was the watch. Remember, this was the yeah. case, like 10 feet from her body was a paint splattered Timex watch. And the paint was found out to just be like household paint, like nothing that brought them any details. And they also found a shoe print that was size 10, which matched up with some other evidence. But the main thing was the confession and the letter sent to the Riverside Police Department and a local paper. And it was typed using a royal typewriter. And it was very taunting. The letter said, quote, she was young and beautiful, but now she is battered and dead. Mm. She is not the first and she will not be the last. I lay awake nights and thinking about my next victim. Miss Bates was stupid. She went to the slaughter like a lamb. She did not put up a struggle, but I did. It was a ball. And it it goes on and on. Mm-hmm. But I, I don't know. That is one thing that comes up that is rather than that list of suspects that is there's just so many of them and we'll get to them. I just do you think that was the start of it? Did he take a two year break? <sighs> Wait, th- what this happened, Sherry happened in 66, right? Correct. And yeah. so, and, and the range of, of murders that we are, or, or authorities pretty much believe started in 68. Is that what you're saying? David Faraday and Darlene was, I think, the end of 68. Like yeah, December it was December 68? of 68. Okay. Yeah. So to do something that horrific and then take a two-year break and then come back from your spree and, I mean, come mm-hmm. back and just bang, 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 bang you yeah. know, and be incredibly prolific as a killer. It doesn't necessarily ring true for me that it's the same person, but I think there was so much bravado there that l- not getting recognition probably could have driven someone crazy. Yeah, I mean, and it sucks. It sucks for this young woman's family because not only do they not have answers, but they're also tossed into this kind of limbo that puts them in this national tabloidy kind of crime circle. And that also just brings the pain up over and over and over again. And so I guess the the deepest part of me wants to say no and just like separate it and let that tragedy be its own tragedy. Mm. Because with, still with no answers. Yeah, because Zodiac nobody- seemed fumbly to me in these first 1968 killings. You yeah. know, that's yeah. not a seasoned professional that has gone and stabbed someone and then yeah. gotten away with it for two years. So I, I don't think it's the same. It reminds me of Shannon Gilbert because she was that the one that they tied 
off of the Long Island serial killer. Uh She was that one 911 call that like went on for 30 minutes Uh. while she was running. (sighs) Yeah. But like there's these this group of murders and then they take her murder and they're like, that wasn't the Long Island serial killer. It's like, okay, well, who was it? Like what happened? Like, you know, it's very, very similar that that, you know, because they clump all of these murders together, you know, the main five and then the other 30 and Sherry Joe is kind of like left out on her own. It just not that any of these stories have closure or even good closure, but I feel like she's like all by herself with like absolutely no answers. No, none. It's and it almost seems scary. safer just to compartmentalize it, you know, totally. um, instead of thinking that she was his training, that she was like his boot camp. Because what do we know about the killer? You know, was he around in 1966? Mm-hmm. All of these yeah. suspects, did they all live in the area in 1966? It com- it almost like we have to reverse engineer it at a certain point when we're this far out. Yeah. Also, do you know, um, Ellen, to what extent do you know, like with Sherry Joe's murder, has there been, I mean, like there's that watch and like, I would ex- suspect that there'd be a lot of forensic evidence in a crime scene like this. Do you know if that was ever like, if it was ever preserved? Under, um, I actually put her under murders. I think it's on page 13, Robbia. 13. Of 35. Um. <laughs> <laughs> it's only 16. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, so at Bates, at her murder, there was a heel print from a shoe, again, the size 10. And there was actually a ton of evidence yeah. because there was hair, mm-hmm. blood. There was also uh, skin found under her nails. And there were fingerprints, palm prints found yeah. all over the car. But none could be matched to anyone and now dna evidence was used back then obviously it's not as sophisticated as it was in 66 yeah there was there was dna there like dna testing and stuff had just started it there was like an article in time magazine actually that year i had no idea i thought it really started like in the late 80s okay i mean that kind of evidence left behind now skin under the fingernails hair they might as well put a yellow arrow and pointed to the guy yeah yeah. Um, it actually was a very, very sloppy crime scene, you know, in comparison to the others. Also, the car had most definitely been tampered with. Uh-huh. This was a huge thing, as he said in his letter, and that detail was not released to the public. Mm. So in his letter, he wrote, I first cut the middle wire from the distributor. Then I waited for her in the library and followed her out. The battery must have been dead by then. So he did tamper with the car. That was not released to the media. So that's how they knew that at least this letter was genuine. At least whoever wrote this letter had some intimate knowledge of the crime, whether or not it was the Zodiac. They just you know, know, Hillary, you said earlier that, you know, you wondered about whether somebody who committed a, a, th- this murder would have waited two years of silence and then suddenly this spate. But when I look at a, when I look at a crime like this, I think this can't be his first kill. Like to me, well, like yeah, that's the. So thing. is like, this yeah. someone that like m- just moved in from across the country? You know, like is this somewhere someone that has practiced elsewhere? And unfortunately, back then we didn't have all of the kind of national databases and things like that that we have now. So someone could have easily come in and been like, all right, well, I'm setting up shop. Fantastic. I think that with the Riverside posting address here, did they, where did they mail the letter from? Was it mailed like from in and about the campus? It had no postmark. Am I looking at the Joseph Bates one right here? There will be more. Oh no, yeah. that that is to oh yes, that's great. No, that's to her dad. So he wrote a letter to her dad too. Yes, yeah, several. This guy's sadistic. I mean, yeah, and I I just refuse to believe that this was just like his very first crime committed. Sure. I'm guessing this guy had a history of violence against women in other ways before he got to this particular. I mean, and it was thought out it was meticulous he like he probably stalked her you know i mean yeah. like this sorry let me go back and answer the question yes that's under rabia if you turn to other communication on page 22 mm-hmm. yes you're right hillary on april 30th 1967 what you were just referring to was the letter that he sent her father Ugh. joseph bates 
And then he mailed another letter that said Bates had to die. There will be more. And those were mailed with a four cent Abraham Lincoln stamp and to the Riverside police, the same Riverside paper and her dad. So we know they all came from the same person because they all had the same like typewriter font. Mm -hmm. They all had the same stamps. They all came from that Riverside. Exactly. Area. Yeah. And it was the royal typewriter. And when we talk about the list of suspects, that will fall under one of them. Hillary, do you want to go to suspects or where do you want to go next? I mean, so I love that. There's honestly so much. I love that my suspect isn't on your list. So I want to talk about these other suspects. Look at Ellen's face. Look at Ellen's face. Honestly, though, truth truth be told, there are so many. I honestly picked like the the, like that those six. But so. I want to hear yours. So let me just tell the audience who's on the list that I sent you. I'm so excited you have someone else. So I arbitrarily chose, <laughs> well, Gary Francis Post, who I want to say I don't think has anything to do with it. That's who the code breakers thought mm. it was. Uh-huh. Then we have Lawrence Klein, Jack Terrence, George Hodell, who you might remember yeah. from the Black Dahlia case, Ross Sullivan, Richard Kajowski, Arthur Lee Allen, and I and who are you gonna tell us about? Tell us everything. Girl, here's here's the thing to understand. So many of these suspects are based in who law enforcement thought was dangerous back in the mm-hmm. 60s and 70s, right? Mm-hmm. And who was dangerous to law enforcement back then? It's the freaks. It was, you know, the mm. queer community. Yeah. It was minority community members. It, you know, it were people who lived on the fringes. And this mm-hmm. identity of the zodiac, you know, that was supposed to strike fear into the hearts of people. Only anybody who's actually in a fringe community knows that the zodiac is like so harmless. It's the least occult word you can pull from the occult. Uh, it's what like a nerd would think is scary. Mm-hmm. Right. And so in reading this book by Jarrett Kobeck, he goes through all these other suspects and he's like, eh, I don't know about this. I don't know about this. And he really taps into something that I think is important when we're looking at historic true crime. And it's it's understanding that the same things that are true today were true back then. Domestic violence is like the leading indicator of whether or not someone is going to commit violence outside of their home. And when you look at, you know, patterns and behavior, who is doing things like what the Zodiac is doing right now? Regular, just white dudes with a family and an alternate yep. secret life? Incels. Yeah. Incels yep. on the internet. Yeah. Is those are the guys being radicalized yeah. and shooting up churches, shooting up schools, going to the mall, you know, like misogynistic women haters. Let's just, yeah. They're the monsters. Down. Yeah. Right. And so, sure, if we want to throw Sherry Joe into this and say, like, this is a misogynist that is practicing yeah. on literally the most vulnerable creature out there, like a college co ed. Yeah. Great training ground for him. As we like dip into this book, he introduces the idea that the language in these letters is really weird, right? Like we can all agree. I think the letters are the most, yeah. I mean, like that's where everybody's attention usually is. And I feel like that's- What do you guys mean when you say weird? There's so many ways to go. Sure. What do you guys it's both It's fantastical about? in a way. Yeah. And, and it sounds cartoonish yeah. in a way. He reaches out to a buddy of his and he's like, does this language about like- the slaves and like the ways that people will die. Does this ring true to you? Mm. And he started looking up just like Google and buzzwords from these letters. And he came up with a Tim Holt comic book from 1950. No. And on this wheel of death, there's death by gun, death by knife, death by fire, death by rope. And, um, it starts sounding very similar to some of the letters that he was sending. Wow. And then there's all these talk, this talk in these comic books, these like sci-fi comic books about like the human slaves and I will make them my slaves and things like that. That's what he said in his letter. That's what he said in his first letter. This writer, Jarrett Kobeck, I love that he talks about himself in the third person in this book. He's like, then Mr. Kobeck reached out to his friend, which I think is just a fantastic writing device. But his friend said, yeah, it sounds like comic books, 
but it sounds more like fanzines. Do you guys mm. remember fanzine culture? No. No. Oh my God. Okay. So what is pre that? In, pre, <laughs> pre-internet. It's like right? we're on her show, Ellen. We're on- I know. Like, tell me more. You guys, I'm <laughs> so nerdy so for I'm this I'm throwing stuff. my 35 pages of research out. This is the Hillary show. We, we just need to call Jarrett right now. Yeah. Honestly, we probably could. He's Rebecca's friend. Rebecca just <laughs> chatted with him the other day. Oh, Should really? I, get him on the call? I would love to talk to this human. Yeah. Like, I would probably become really bashful and nervous that I was presenting his work wrong because he did an extraordinary amount of work. Wow. But what he's saying here is that fanzine culture existed before the internet. Right now we've got all these dudes on 4chan hyping each other up, but what did they do in the 50s and 60s and early 70s? They wrote fanzines, which were just like pieces of paper stapled together that they would fan Xerox. Fiction. Like fan yes. fiction. Yeah. It's fan fiction that they would create themselves. And so what they what he starts looking for are references and fanzines that line up with what the Zodiac is doing. And he knew that the Zodiac killings were happening in Vallejo. And so he just puts into a Google search, Vallejo fanzines. Wow. And all of a sudden, these fanzines from the 60s pop up. And who should pop up as the creator of two of these is a man named Paul Doerr, D-O-E-R-R. So he starts Googling this dude, right? And he just does what all of us at home do and falls into the trap of like pulling threads. And so he finds that this man created two different fanzines. One was about hobbits, right? Mm -hmm. And the other was a survivalist one called Pioneers. And he had subscribers all over the country. He'd create his little magazines. He'd send them out. He would solicit for other people to put their own articles in his magazines. But at the same time, all these crimes are happening in like the Vallejo area. He has a P.O. box there where he is creating all of this content and using very similar language. Mm. He's buying and selling guns through his fanzines, getting rid of weapons that he's used in the past. There's a paper trail of this man that this author finds that spans from the 1950s to when he died in the 2000s. And he spent every year of his life basically writing letters to the editor. So it would not be out of the realm of possibility mm. that this well-practiced yeah. writer yeah. is the one crafting letters like this, knowing he can get away with it. Yeah. So Jarrett is like going through all of these old fanzines from the 50s and 60s, and certain libraries have you know, copies of them. And he's trying to trace them down and he's lying to everyone. He's not mm-hmm. telling them he's looking for the Zodiac killer. He tells them he's doing an Ancestry.com like, like research <laughs> project. Yeah. And what he finds is that in one of in one of the fanzines for Hobbitalia, which was just all about Lord of the Rings and mm-hmm. Hobbits and stuff, this man writes in cipher and writes in cipher over and over and over again and encourages everyone else to do the same. And like loves writing secret messages and all of these fanzines he's working on. And so I don't want to spoil the book, but yeah. like you yeah. guys, yeah. this is a really the, super strong suspect. The thing that is so hard about, and I did pass his name, but we have to remember that there have been like 2,500 suspects. Oh, yeah. Thousands. Which is bananas. And the thing that makes all of this so you know that emoji where it's like yeah. it's just the head coming off of your own head the thing that makes it that emoji is that so many of them are plausible sure because you're like six things make sense from that one and eight things make sense from that one and every time i read i'm like i mean arthur lee allen seems like a cuckoo banana man and so it's like when you're talking, I'm also very easily swayed. You're talking, I'm like, oh my god, it's so that guy. But then, it's I, but, Paul. but then, but what, yeah. But what then, sets him apart from the other suspects that, uh, or at least the ones that you, I mean, uh, that you uh, highlighted um, in your research, and I'd say probably a lot of others. A lot of the other suspects seem like they're the kind of suspect that's like, well, they were in the area, they might have had some criminal history, they might have acted weird, but to me, like. 
the most the most important evidence in this case are is the letters who had the ability to write like that who was going to use language like that who i feel like that's in the absence of like forensic material like that is your forensics right there right and i don't know if the analysis was done in terms of like all these other suspects, if you would find as strong a connection to the language and 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 these letters as you do to this Paul Dewar guy. And I'm seeing that he was also ex-military. So yeah. he, you know what I mean? Uh, and yeah, a lot of these guys were all ex-military. Mm. And to your point, Rabia, so many of these kills, these murders were very messy. Mm -hmm. I mean, and quite solvable. I mean, there's two survivors and Paul Stein, there was like bloody fingerprints all over the car. Mm -hmm. This was not one of those things like, you know, we see cases where it's like, did a ghost come and do this? Yeah. It's not like that at all. So that even adds like I mean, when you have layer. fingerprints and you have all this kind of <sighs> stuff, it's like. How have they not eliminated so many of their suspects, including Paul Dewar or Doer? I don't know how to pronounce his last name. I mean, it's my um, understanding he's dead now. Right? It wouldn't matter. I mean, like even if and he's it dead, doesn't. And you know, for me, some of the research in this book is so great because it really gets down to the brass tacks of what was happening then. Not like how did we interpret it over the course of ten years, yeah. twenty years, thirty years, but yeah. what was happening then? And the day in the park that Darlene and Mike were no i'm sorry that was that night was it cecilia shepherd and brian were the ones that were the killed ones that yeah. were yeah. on the uh, the picnic yes that so, was david faraday and betty jensen that was the first, the first couple one. yeah no who no i'm oh, sorry i'm oh, talking no, no, about no, no, cecilia that... and brian with the hooded costume and the knife oh right? yes 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 uh -huh. the hood yeah. and the knife so is that was weird when... right mm -hmm. Oh yeah. So for for those of you who don't know, the basically this guy came out from the trees and he was wearing like a four cornered like hood. Mm -hmm. And Which, what is had, that even? What is a four? Is that like a? It's an executioner's bag? mask. Yeah, like a it, it's like up like this, like almost it looks like a square, like a bib, like a big. Bib oh, it's four over corners his... this way, not four corn. Okay, anyway, it's yes, okay. exactly, and it had the cross well, circle terrifying. design yeah. that had appeared in the cryptogram, the zodiac signature. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So what Mister Jarrett Kobeck uncovers is that at this right before, right before that happened, a fanzine comes out for Hobbitalia that says, hey, we have so many people interested in our subject matter. Should we have a convention? He's basically saying, like, mm -hmm. should we have, like, our own little Comic-Con back before yeah. that was a thing? Yeah. And so he talked about how up in San Francisco they were doing events like that. Well, lo and behold, the same exact day that killing happens with the hood, there's a Renaissance Fair in the San Francisco Bay Area. Do you and, know where? Where was that? Because I asked because was that one in Napa? It was like the third year of it. I'm going to pull it up right now. Do we have enough tokens in the San Francisco area for a token con? What about the entire West Coast? I'd like to hear from any nearby, mail or phone or whatever. And so that is something that Dor puts out. We know that the third annual Renaissance Pleasure Fair and Happy Market – took place that weekend in September of 1969, including the 27th. It was... What was it called, Hillary? The third annual Renaissance Pleasure Fair and Ha-Penny Market. There's a, there's a little comma after the A. H-A, comma. Ha-Penny, yeah. Like half-penny. The Ha-Penny. Yeah. And it was open every single weekend or weekend day of September 1969, including the 27th. It was happening in San Rafael in Marin County across the Golden Gate Bridge from San Francisco, about an hour and a half drive from Lake Berryessa. Berryessa. Okay, so so it's San Rafael in Marin. That is, okay, so Lake Berryessa would be, yes, it would be, did they say like an hour? That's like an hour away. Yeah, it's like an hour away. Where's Vallejo in comparison. Vallejo is out more towards the SFO airport. I'm from this area, Hillary. Yeah. So like I grew up with like the Zodiac, but not knowing enough. But so I'm probably Vallejo... making you crazy by pronouncing everything wrong. <laughs> oh, it, 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 it does. 
<laughs> it doesn't, none of it makes sense. I used to call San Jose San Josie. Josie. No, yeah, San Josie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Vallejo is out towards like uh, Benicia. It's actually beautiful out there. Um, it's like South Bay, like more towards like the airport. We covered a case out there. Um, and it it is, it's beautiful. And you mm-hmm. don't realize how rural it can get in some of those oh, yeah. places. Um, like cows and But I also when I hear that things are an hour and a half apart, that never seems like a problem to me because I live in this rural area where I have to yeah. drive an hour to get anywhere. That's you yeah, know? That's, that's just a yep. daily drive to yeah. Go to no biggie. Wow, um, uh, that is such a crazy connection because the murders of uh, Cecilia and Brian that happened September twenty seventh, nineteen sixty nine. Yeah. Okay. So there was a note that was left on the car that had the top of the note had that sign that was apparently also mm-hmm. on the hood, and it said Vallejo twelve twenty sixty eight. The date twelve twenty sixty eight, and then the date seven four sixty nine, and then says September twenty seven sixty nine six thirty. So that's the that's the date and the time he killed them, and it says by right. knife. But the two yeah, dates those, before that, what are the two dates before that? Those are the dates of his other kills. His other kills. Yeah, those were the dates of Darlene Farron and Mike McGow and David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen. You know, his first one was that Lovers Lane yeah. one, which actually taps into what you were saying, Hillary, of someone who's like an incel because he went after two couples originally. Yeah. They were like at makeout point or yeah. something. And then the other one on like a romantic picnic. So Rabia, those dates were like his scorecard, okay. which also Excludes. would then say, which then would also say that he never took credit right. for Sherry Joe. So then that would actually lead to say that maybe it wasn't the Zodiac because if he was doing his bragging rights, mm-hmm. he why would wouldn't he include yeah. that, you know, his sick, twisted mind of look at everything that I've done that I've gotten away with? And uh, he maybe because we know that this one particular suspect was such a voracious newspaper and magazine reader, had he seen the Cherry Joe case? Because that was a big deal. Yeah. That a young mm-hmm. woman was murdered and seen the attention that a letter got, maybe that's the light bulb moment where it's mm-hmm. like, this is how I get attention. Yeah. Yeah. That'll be my calling card. Yeah. Let's yeah. talk about that because to your point that you made earlier, Hillary, this was not about killing. Mm-mm. This was not a Jeffrey Dahmer or Ted Bundy. When you listen to them, you just say, like, when you listen to those Dahmer tapes and you're like, oh, Mike, you are an animal. You are a real animal. It wasn't about that. The Zodiac didn't appear to be obsessed with killing. He was obsessed with with the fame, Mm -hmm. which is why when we get to the Paul Stein murder, I think is so different because... But but there is that one note in which he says, I like killing people because it's so much fun. It's more fun than killing wild game. To give to kill something gives me the most thrilling experience. It is even better than getting a rocks off with a girl, which again goes back to like, I do think he's getting some kind of a sexual thrill from these kills. I think he's bragging to the cops because he has some kind of a need for attention because if you're killing just to kill, but why are you sending these letters and these ciphers? And he's getting off because remember, they sent those, you know, he sent the letter and said, print this letter in the newspaper, right? He wanted these ciphers to yeah. get solved. And they did. They printed it. Mm-hmm. Everybody is trying to figure it out, right? Those two teachers crack the first cipher. But this is what he loves. He has the Bay Area in chaos. He's the first thing that everybody is talking about. And so that is what he's getting off on. He's getting off on this chaos. And he's doing it right under the noses of these people. He called them. He called them on the phone mm-hmm. and then sent letters and was like, ha ha, look what I did. So it's, that is what makes it even more confusing his need for attention, really. I mean, it's a hunt. He he wants the, he wants to be chased. There's a thrill there for him. Oh yeah. He almost wants to be found, but he's taunting the police. He's like, look, I mean, that's power. 
That's but he's also he... taunting them with like pop culture references, mm. right? So we know the most dangerous game. We know that book. Yep. We, yep. You know, we yep. know that story. We've got that. these comic book references. Mm-hmm. There is, hold on, there's even something from uh, Gilbert and Sullivan's The Mikado. Really? A reference to that as well? It's from the Little List letter in 1970. And so he's making these pop culture references. And when it comes down to writing letters to the police about what he's gotten away with, when he writes about that Lover's Lane killing on July 4th, right? The 4th of Mm -hmm. July one. Mm -hmm. I think she was like an older married woman meeting up with like a teenage boy. He was like a couple years younger. He was 19. Mm. Yeah, it was a little salacious. It was a little she, scandalous. Yeah. She goes on drinking with married. this kid. So yeah. the letter that arrives to law enforcement is a total ripoff of a recent – maybe it wasn't recent. It's a total ripoff of a popular mechanics article that was written – about tactical gear for the military and how strapping a flashlight onto the gun allows you to use the little dark spot in the middle Mm -hmm. of the flashlight as your means of aiming the gun. Only at the distance that the victim was shot and where the Zodiac was, it's not applicable, right? Mm -hmm. Like when you're shining a flashlight that far away, it doesn't hold up. Right. So what we see is this pattern of him like pulling from pop culture, pulling from other magazines and using sound bites that he thinks sound intimidating and like, ooh, I'm a mastermind. Also probably because he doesn't as a creative and articulate enough himself to piece together like, you know, I mean, although the, the cipher itself is it takes some 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 intellect. But um, all the other like language and stuff, you know, he, I mean, I, but I wonder, I wonder if that was, if it's because he wasn't creative intellectual enough or it was just like another, these are hints he are, he is giving. These are clues he is drawing. They're like just little eggs he's hiding for people to try to figure out. Well, I think it's the exact opposite. I think okay. rather than him not being smart enough, I think he's probably a man who in his day-to-day life is not respected and not treated as intelligent, and he's got a chip Mm -hmm. on his shoulder about it. And so he is not only going to commit these crimes and get away with it, but he's also going to prove that he's well-read, that he understands mechanics, and he's a survivalist, which is not something that a lot of people were dipping their toes in back then. Right, 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 right. right. That he can understand and break codes, that he not only can deal with, like, this realm, but he can also understand, like, fairy realm and speak their language. Like, this is someone who's desperately trying to prove themselves and get the respect Mm. that they think they deserve. But what do you make of all the spelling errors? The spelling errors are totally on purpose. Absolutely. Oh, okay. Yes. 100%. 100%. Why? To, to throw people off? I mean, he, he spells so many things incorrectly. Yeah. Well, in the first letters, he's not doing it as much. It becomes mm-hmm. a thing. I mean, to me personally, I think it's probably something that he accidentally did in the first letter and then saw in the newspaper that they, like, they picked up, called yeah. him out for his typos. And he's like, yeah, I meant to do that. For sure. Oh, yeah. That's such a good call. And one of the words that. that he spells wrong is cipher. He spells it like C-Y-I-P-H-E-R. And in his fanzines, he spells cipher with a Y. And then in the letters to the newspaper. I'm sold. I'm sold. Listen, (laughs) all I'm saying is we need Jarrett. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. Honestly, when we do a couple more things, we we do a little like anything we didn't cover, we cover um, on our Patreon. But Hillary, at this rate, you're going to come back in. Well, because I want to know. So, and, but this is what's so genius to me is that I'm sitting here and like, We've all been scratching our head for decades, right? Like, who did this? Who did this? It's the exact same person who's doing it today. It's the exact same mindset. My same kind humanity of doesn't change. Yeah. And so instead of looking at the artists and the freaks and the bohemians, which is what they were doing, look at the incels. Look at the mm-hmm. men who have a chip mm-hmm. on their shoulder who want to prove their worth or, you know, prove their status and – some of these suspects completely disappear from the list. Yeah. I want to say my – I just want to throw my suspect out Yeah, there. give it to me. Because look, okay. we, we have to explore all options. We no, must. it's really true because so many things will come up and I fall down these holes and I'm like, that's it. Oh, mm-hmm. for sure. Oh, no, that's – it's kind of like if you're like dress shopping. You're like, this is my favorite. No, 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 no. This is my mm-hmm. favorite. Like yeah. every single one I would get drawn to. But I think – 
I'm very, very intrigued by Paul. And I'm sa- I just had to choose a handful mm-hmm. of them to dive into. So the one that made the most sense to me was Arthur Lee Allen. All right, let's pull up Arthur. Let me see Arthur. So for Arthur Lee Allen's on um, page five, for those of you following along. Now, I didn't, I, I again, I bounced back and forth. George Hodel, we spoke a lot about Black Dahlia, and that really does make a lot of sense. But I just want to go through a couple key he points. He makes no sense for this. I mean, no, it's just no, no, no. Jack, he really yeah. doesn't. But he was, you know, he was definitely because he was. He was a journalist for the San Francisco Chronicle. I mean, yeah, a lot of it can be explained away. You're absolutely right. Okay, so what got me on Arthur Lee Allen, he comes up a lot in the Sherry Jo Bates case. So that could be, that could be the answer to that, you know? So the thing that gets me is that he was, he was an elementary school teacher. He actually was a very brilliant man. He had like three science degrees or something like that. He was absent from school the day after her death. And then going back, he he did have a criminal record. He had an altercation with someone named Ralph Spinelli. And mm-hmm. this was back in 1958. But the Zodiac would later write letters to someone named Marco Spinelli, right? Okay, great. That's that that can be excused away as well. So he was fired from his job for sexually assaulting a student, and he was forced to move back home with his mom and dad, and he, back to Vallejo. And then there's a lot of research that says that he suffered from substance abuse disorder. He was doing drugs. He had an alcohol problem. And so there, there were a lot of things going on there. But he was about seven minutes away from the Lake Herman Road crime scene. Mm-hmm. He was known to have a really bad temper, which was exacerbated by his recent drinking due to his shame to being fired. He owned a royal typewriter, the same that was used for all of the letters to the paper. And, okay, so this is crazy, and you have to take it for what it's worth. He was given a Zodiac watch by his mother in 1969, and started to call himself Zodiac, not the Zodiac, but Zodiac. And this was a, according to a friend of his name, Dawn. And then he said, yeah, he was going to stop signing his name, Arthur, and he was going to use the Zodiac sign a la Prince. Like that was going to be his new. But he's doing this thing. in 69, like after yeah. the letters and the murders have already started. Yeah. But that but that's when he like told Don. So okay. he was like he was like, oh, yeah, I signed my name now like this, you know, symbol Prince. It's I'm in my DeLorean. You don't know who Prince is. Yeah. <laughs> but it just all kind of like lined up. I don't know. Again, I can make I could make a case for so many of these mm-hmm. suspects. But what do you guys think about those? Well, what do we know about Zodiac? Could Arthur Lee Allen have created these? uncrackable ciphers. He was very, very smart. He had several like science degrees. Like he was an elementary school teacher and he was also like highly, highly intellectual. But do we see any place in his life where he did specifically that? Because that there's a lot of smart people on the planet and I'm very yeah. smart, ladies. I don't do code. Yeah. I don't I don't like cracking codes. That's not funny. I don't even mess with Sudoku, Sakudo, no, whatever it's, it's called. Same. I don't want to play your dumb games. Yeah. <laughs> so finding like specificity yeah. mm-hmm. is important when we're analyzing suspects like this. And yeah. so that's a big deal because that's a big part of who the Zodiac is. Mm-hmm. Like, what else do we know about him? You know, this is someone who, who uh, it, to antagonized me it seems like, and wrote letters. It seems to me like with this with uh, this Arthur guy, it's almost like he's watching this unfold in the in, in the media, and he's like, "I'm adopting this, like kind of like he wants to be part of this thing that's happening." And so he's like, like a copycat. This. Yeah, a hundred percent. And it doesn't mm-hmm. seem sound like. I mean, okay, he he has had a couple of. Well, let's see, one sexual assault or – I mean, he doesn't seem to have a violent – yeah, but it, I don't know. I, he I don't seems better anything. for the Cherry Joe Bates thing, which I think is a side issue. It is. Yes, it is. Uh, it's totally a side issue. I mean, the only thing being the same was the letters, but the letters didn't include ciphers Mm-mm. of any kind. And the it the letter was – 
printed again on the royal typewriter. I guess I should have looked up how common those were. I'm sure they were pretty. I mean, like, I, I just, it's just not, it's not a, it's just not as many, there's not enough connective tissue as we see with this other suspect, I, I think. Okay, well, I'm going to come back with even more. Yeah, um, I want more. <laughs> Feed me. Well, one of the things that I am fascinated with is it seems like, January 29th, 1974, with the exorcist letter. Like, that seems to be, like, uh -huh. where people kind of say, well, that's, like, the last known definite, right, letter from him. Do you think what, – what do you think happened to the Zodiac after that? Like, where did he go? Like, why did he stop, like, doing what he was doing? So the Wait. last crime that was absolutely attributed to him – was Paul Stein. Okay. And Paul Stein was the cab driver. Yeah. And I do have a theory on that. I want to hear your theory, Hillary. So Paul Stein was 29 years old. He was actually in um, uh, grad school yeah. at the time. And he was driving. He picked up the Zodiac and he shot him once in the head at point blank range which all of the all of the murders that he ever committed were using different weapons. That's something very interesting to remember. Yes. Now, there were three witnesses that night. And when they called the police, the dispatcher said the wrong identification mm -hmm. because uh, and, and oddly enough, there was a small robbery. He took his keys and his wallet and also a portion of his shirt. That will be important later. And again, left a messy crime scene. Three fingerprints, three palm prints, a lower fingerprint. Like it was it was a mess. But they called in and then they told the cops they were looking for a black man. Yeah. Mm. And he wasn't looking for a black man. And they think that he passed right by him uh -huh. because the cops wow. saw him. Now, my theory on that was that, you know, he had been playing all of these games. And I and, and the Paul Stein murder was the closest he ever came to getting caught. And that was based on pure luck because... Yeah. I think he was almost trying to get caught. And then as someone who, like, is in such desperate need for attention, he's just like, I mean, fuck it. I just walked right in front of the cops and you're not. This Nothing. is no fun. You guys aren't even playing the game right. Yeah. I mean, I think what that killing did was it assured that he was more than like a lover's lane killer. Mm -hmm. You know, at this point, he had preyed upon women and younger men and this was him killing a man and just nobody even law enforcement looked at him and thought him so helpless and harmless yeah. he couldn't possibly do it like i don't know how you geld someone worse than that by saying oh you Certainly not. Um, I mean, he was like right across the street from the car. There was like a park that was mm -hmm. where the car was parked. And they saw him like right at that park. Uh, it, so that's an emasculating thing to happen to someone, especially someone who fancies themselves dangerous. Mm, totally. Yeah. And, and the days of these killings were also important too because there was like a Friday-Saturday component to a lot of these killings that mm. indicated a work schedule. Yeah. 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 It was always that on the weekend. He was like, I mean, nine to five, babe. I got – I have bills Gotta to be pay. on the clock, yep. Yeah, yeah, and a family, you know, and like or, so, – or something to like regulate that schedule. The getting rid and acquiring weapons – in an untraceable fashion is an important mm -hmm. thing to look at because think about how any of these other suspects might get away with that, right? Like how would they reasonably do that? Do they walk into a pawn shop? Right. Would they meet people in parking lots? How would you advertise something like that? In what I want to say like 1968, there was – there was a bill that was passed. There was a law that was passed. In October 1968, the United States Congress passed a ban on unlicensed mail order guns. It was the consequence of the assassinations of John F. Kennedy, Robert F. Kennedy, and Martin Luther King Jr., right? Mm -hmm. okay. And wow. so at that time, Paul Doerr is using all of these fanzines to buy and sell weapons over and over and over and over again. And so it was something that people had their eye on. 
right? Yeah. It was something yeah. that every pawn yeah. shop in the country knew was like, uh -uh, we're going to get yeah. in trouble for this. Yeah. Um, so finding someone who had the ability to do that is important when yeah. you're trying to figure out who the suspect was. Did Paul Dewar have a, did he have a nine to five? Yeah, he worked at a, uh, it was a military facility. He was former Navy. He was like a Navy medic. Yeah, it was just like a government base, no big whoop. It, no danger there, but it still was like a uniform, I'm important kind of job. I do love that whoever the Zodiac was, was like, listen, uh, honestly, I can't, I need to schedule my murder time around <laughs> my work time. He worked at Mare Island Naval Base. And so he moved... So he originally was from Pennsylvania. Mm. He was abandoned in early life by his father. He served in the Navy as a medic. And then in 1963, he moved to California. And for decades, he worked on Mare Island Naval Base. He didn't live in Vallejo. He lived 20 miles northeast in Fairfield. But he kept the Vallejo post office box from 1964 to 1976. There's your guns right there um, coming in the mail. Yeah. Did he wear glasses? Yeah, I was wondering about that because I'm reading this description that um, the the witnesses oh, yeah. in, in the Stein case called. And the witnesses, what they described was exactly what the cops saw. So white male, 25 to 30 years old, around 5'9", stocky, reddish brown hair, and a crew cut. And I'm looking at a picture of Paul Doerr yeah. and I'm like, oh, that's reddish brown hair and a crew cut. <laughs> So yep. here's the deal. So, <laughs> guys, you have to yeah. buy this book. This I'm is just a freaking. I, I literally ordered it while while it's we were an on infomercial for this book it. at this point. Okay, so yeah. here's here's the drawing that we have yeah. of the suspect, right? Mm -hmm. And so what Mr. Kobeck understands is that people can wear disguises. Like if this is yeah. a man who's going to put a bag over his head, putting on glasses to disguise himself also seems pretty reasonable. Right. And so he just like erases the glasses. The glasses. <laughs> he's like, let's see what this person looks like without glasses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And then he's like, but also let's see like maybe what he looks like with a mustache. And so he just sketches on a mustache and holds it up next to a picture of Paul Dore. Oh my God. Like, why are we even having this conversation? Yeah. <laughs> the wow. case is solved. But so apparently, you know, he's th th this author, this investigator has turned over all this, you know, his research and findings to the police and they've done nothing with it. Isn't that maddening though? Yeah. And, and And that, I think, is the crime that we're talking about today, mm -hmm. that we probably – could compare evidence. We probably could yeah. look at these fingerprints. I don't know what is still like viable in, you know, evidence files from this case, but there's an avalanche of forensic evidence here. There should be, yeah. And it's not a priority for anybody to test it. It was not the none of the crime scenes were clean. He at the Paul Stein murder, he left a pair of gloves behind. It, I think he wanted to get caught. He was like bread. What's he gonna He's take? Like, I'm, I'm, I'm walking with a bagel yeah. back to my apartment. Does anyone want to pick up the pigeons? Got it. Like, well. he, it's just everything is going wrong for him. It's like he tried everything to get caught. It's like the keystone coppery of it all. And then those two cops are like, meh. Uh, we're not he looks like a, a weenie. <laughs> Don't even look at him. What a loser. I mean, glasses, you know, the whole get, I mean, you know, 5'8", five, 5'9", five, not, not that tall. So, you know, maybe, yeah, he just, he was so unassuming to them. I still can't figure out why he just suddenly stopped. Okay. So this is my theory. Okay. This go, go, go. dude, this dude went and he purchased land in Oregon, right? Door did. Paul. Door did. And he starts soliciting in his fanzines and in other magazines looking for people who want to start a commune with him. Oh, he's just killing Oregon. him on his own property. <laughs> he's just killing him on his own property. That and when saying? he can't get like normal chicks to respond to him, he starts writing to women in prison, I believe. Now, I recall reading that part where he was like writing to chicks in prison, being like, come join me on my beautiful farm, my commune in Oregon. Wow. And there are pictures of his, his house and it's a kill shed. It's 100% a kill shed. Oh my God. And That's so terrifying. he just developed a different fantasy, yeah. you know, which happens. Alan's got her hand raised. Give it. Okay. So I didn't even, it was, it's impossible to dive into all of those mystery murders mm -hmm. after the main five. Yeah. Did any of them take place in Oregon? Would they have even been counted? 
Right. I think they're only looking at like the Bay Area. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, because they have, I mean, honestly, the amount of times I cursed your name in my home. All you had to do was read one book. (laughs) You guys put my QR codes in the back of the book for all the pictures. (laughs) Wow. Uh, well, no, because it's just so much. My cats are like, is that that Hillary bitch you've been screaming <laughs> yeah. about? It's I'm me. like, Hillary! There's so I've gotten a lot of messages from Ellen in the last few days, let's just say. It's because it's just so much, and I, yeah. I want to, like, you know, absorb it all. But, I mean, that's, like, one of the main things. They were like, well, maybe he killed five people, but also maybe he killed, like, 37. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, 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 and who's to know? Because he also, this particular suspect – because he had been in the Navy, he was big on boats. He had his own boat that he mm-hmm. said he was working on and talked about going out on the water all the time and would invite women to go out on the water via these classified ads. And so who knows how many bodies he dumped from right. a boat, you know? Like, oh, we don't know. God. Well, you know, I, but, but here's the thing I wonder, what, what I wonder. If so much of the thrill for him was about the recognition Mm-hmm. Wouldn't he be just claiming people left and right and not just, you know? Yeah, well, and I think that's it. They Some of the people who survived described him as hesitant. They described him as like, mm. like it was like he was putting on a show. Like he had to like amp himself up. There was an awkwardness to this killer. And to me, that says someone who doesn't really like love what they're doing. There's not like bloodlust there, but knows that they have to do it. It's a means to an end. Just do it. You no, know, you're you're right because the couple Cecilia and Brian mm-hmm. is that the one he the ones on the survived? picnic, I, yeah, because he survived, right? Yeah, because um Cecilia and Brian Brian thought that he was like placating to him. Yeah, mm. he was like, "I'll give you whatever." He did not think he was going to hurt him. So yeah, mm. that I never thought of that. But in that one, he was like. We just thought that he wanted our stuff and he was going to go away. And then he just snapped. And so once you establish this personality of the Zodiac, once you are feared by the media firestorm, you don't actually have to kill anybody anymore. Now you just get to like mm. taunt, yeah. right? Yeah. And he's getting exactly what he wants. You know, people are still talking about it. We're talking about it. And he didn't have to do any extra work, which is also the sign of a man. He's like, look, I took the trash out. I did it once. I don't want to hear anything mm-hmm. else. Yeah. He got everything he wanted. He was like, you know, post the and he got away with it. in, in oh, the yeah. three biggest newspapers and they posted it and they did everything mm-hmm. and they did everything he asked for because of the fear and chaos he instilled in the Bay Area. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's. So for me, you know, the big thing on the show that I do, it couldn't happen here, is that I always like a call to arms. I'm always like, what comes next, right? Mm. I find it incredibly frustrating that this investigator and this writer did all of this work and did it in a really thoughtful, methodical way and like nothing's happening with it. Yeah. And so my call to arms is like, what? I'll get loud. I think this should be looked at professionally. The thing is, there's like no real legal way to compel it. Every state now has some kind of DNA petition mechanism on the books for defendants Uh who are like, they still have to fight to get it done, but they can, there's actually a legal mechanism for them to like a, a petition for this. I really think what we need is to have something similar for victims' families to be yeah. able to, somebody who, to have standing, you know what I mean? Somebody has to have standing to demand this. The victim's family also be, I mean, I wonder if a civil suit could work in a situation like this, even though there's no specific, you know, statute under which uh, victims' families have these rights. But the, I mean, the problem is there's no legal way to compel it. And so I think that would be interesting uh, I'm going to check in with some victims advocacy groups to see if that's something they've ever even considered. But there should be. A victim's family should have oh the right God. to say, you have this. I want you to do the genetic genealogy. I want you to, like, mm-hmm. you can't just be like, oh, well, we have it and we're done. Or hand it over. If you don't want to do the job, hand it over to, a, like, you know, some lab or a team of investigators. I'm sure or, we could yeah. crowdfund. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. So many yeah. of us are like, if I could just get my hands on the physical evidence, we could solve X, Y, Z case. I mean, this happens all yeah. the time. Yeah. Well, and how many victims' families have come forward and said, I don't think the person who's sitting in prison actually killed my loved one. Yeah. Like giving yeah. victims' families a voice would also help 
the defense in yeah. a lot mm-hmm. of situations. Yeah. It's just, you know, prosecutors that want to defend their records that are like, no, no, nothing to see here. Pass. I mean, the thing, the problem is, you know, like what a police agency, I guess, would say in this case is like, it's a cold case. It's still open. We don't give our files to, you know, well, but you're not doing nothing. <laughs> no. Not no. Doing oh, God. Now. Look. Whoever's running for office out there, like run on this. Figure this mm. shit out. Paul Door, I just want a PowerPoint presentation on all the reasons why it is Paul. Hillary, we're, we're I love a PowerPoint. Happen. Ask Rabia. I <laughs> love a PowerPoint. Yep. There's a question in the chat before we uh, sign off here. Do you think they're not going to pursue because Paul is dead? That's a dumb reason not to it's pursue a dumb reason. justice. Yeah. Yeah, there are yeah. a lot of dead suspects out there. Yeah. I'm going to cover a case in Alabama this weekend where the person who most likely committed the murder died. And so law enforcement was like, eh, I guess, yeah, forget it. You can't leave without talking about your book, your new book. Oh, hey, thanks. So yes. in my fight against the patriarchy and mm-hmm. against <laughs> incels, I put out a grimoire of witchcraft because nothing yes. frightens men more than a little bit of spell work. Oh, it's amazing. I started like kind of compiling all the different journals I'd kept over the years, and I realized what I was creating was a grimoire, which is a book that women historically kept of all the life-saving knowledge that mm. they wanted to oh, I love it so much. remind themselves of and also pass down to their offspring. And so I wrote this grimoire that's a mix of memoir, but also magical thinking and tips and like, you know, general witchery. <laughs> I have never seen or gotten a more beautiful book swag box than what came with Grimoire Girl. It's Your incredible. box was hard to live up to, Ravia. The chai was like no. a game changer. It, it, when I is mean, that coming out on the market? That Oh, that book's been out. But the paper you know, I'm talking about out. your like oh, personal chai. like kitchen blends. The, you know what? I it's like one of the it's been backburnered. I need like a business partner to help me do it. But you guys, you have to go get okay. Grimoire Girl, Memoir of Magic and Mischief. It is so powerful. It is beautiful. I love Thank it so you. much. Thanks. We'll post all about it when the episode comes out, yep. but where's is the best place to get it? Your website? Just so you can get the book literally anywhere. Yeah. Um, but right. I also I sign copies through my local independent bookstore, Oblong Books, in mm-hmm. Rhinebeck, New York. And so I always like supporting local, local yeah. businesses. Right. Um, so yeah, we'll it's everywhere. We'll post all about that for sure. Yeah, thanks, guys. That we would get the word out. Hillary, you're a dream, but like this is not over. I know. Like this, is, like, this needs to be like a 10-parter. We're you all going to go do our homework. <laughs> you're all, you, are, you are the best informed um, guest we've ever had. Really? hundred uh, percent. It's a tie between Hillary and Dan Bukotinsky. Okay, Dan was pretty good too. But I think Hillary, I think Hillary wins. But we're going to take yeah. this show on the road and just like solve other people's problems. You know, Hillary, I'm going to literally hang up this. I'm going to research Paul, and then we're going to get back on a call. Yes, and I'm going to tell you everything I find. Oh God, I can't wait. I can't wait. It's been like six months since I read this second book. So wow. I'm I'm down so, for it. Where can folks find you online, Hillary? How can they follow you? Yes, yes I am on Instagram at Hillary Burton um, and also X or Twitter or whatever the hell that is now. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, my publisher, Harper One, has a whole Grimoire Girl page that's on the link in my bio. And in the meantime, we're shooting It Couldn't Happen Here. Um, I love that series so much. Yeah, yeah, just trying to get the word out. There's a lot of injustice out there. And unless – bitchy moms show up and start complaining about it. It's never yeah. going to change. It's all down to us bitchy you moms. You are yeah. truly amazing. You mm-hmm. are so smart. You are as smart as you are gorgeous and talented. And now oh, I'm just going to bother you a lot. <laughs> when do I get to come to your farm? Yeah, do it. All right. So Ravia has all my information. You guys, let's just come hang out. Can I come to your farm? I just yeah. really want to yeah, see Yeah, you farm. need to be here. Yeah. You need to uh, be here. We'll do it. All right. Thank you so much, Hillary. Thank you so much. So thank you so much to Hillary Burton. Quite possibly our most prepared, informed guest. Uh, Be sure and uh, make sure you are following us on all of our social media. That is on Instagram and the like at Rabia and Ellen. And where, what else should they do, Rabia? Give them some, give them, boss them around a little bit. We're on YouTube. Look, every every three times a week, we got to like try to look decent and get on video just so you can have our YouTube channel. So please subscribe to our YouTube. Get on our Facebook page. Did you already say that? 
Yeah, no, I didn't say that, but right. our Facebook page is there. We have lots of yep. great conversations about this episode, other episodes. All we welcome new members all the time. Yeah. And please, if you have not and you have a little extra to spend and you want some more content, we give you About Damn Crime, which is our weekly true crime catch-up. You get that four times a month in the mm-hmm. Patreon. It's every other month on the general feed. And then we give you all kinds of gems like watch parties. We've had a ton of watch parties this year. We have whenever something comes up and we want to watch it, we watch it together. And it's a lot of fun. And you get that on our Discord server, which you also have access to, as well as a couple more things, our Speak Pipe episodes, and more. We're just always interacting with our Patreon. We call them the Jury Box, and they are amazing. We hope you can join us. Anything else, Rabia? Oh, where can they find you on Instagram? Uh, at Rabia Squared with the number two. So write out Rabia Squared and then the number two. Yeah, that's it. And I'm at Ellen Marsh, and I spell my name with a Y. Unclear as why that is the case, but until then. Thanks, Mom. Until next time. We love you guys. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.